Well, good morning, everybody. And David, welcome back to New Zealand again. Yeah, great. No, I'm so delighted to be here. My wife said to me, New Zealand, August, you must be balmy. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, it is balmy, yeah. you know, but with an L, <laughs> frankly. It's uh, delightful to be here. But with an opportunity to be with us, how could you turn that down? And David and I today have designed for you a tasting menu of topics, a regular smorgasbord of things for us to talk about. And we're going to put it up on the screen shortly and dive into some of those topics. We might not have time to cover them all, but David, what do you think we should start talking to? Mm, okay, uh, I don't know. Oh, let's, uh, oh, we'll just wait for the menu to come up. Yeah, okay, let's... Yeah, there click. you go. Here we go. Fast food. What, why not? Let's start on the top left, robotics. Why not? The, uh, the minister, Damien, mentioned uh, uh, labor, the problems associated with that, etc. What about artificial intelligence robotics? Robotics, always a family favorite, almost as good as fish and chips or sausage rolls. So let's dive into robotics. How many of you know about Moore's Law? Yeah, few hands showing, not that many. Moore's Law was an observation that said you can, every couple of years you can squeeze twice as much onto a silicon chip. And that meant that the power of computing kind of did an exponential curve like that, doubling every few years in its power, and the cost went the other way, like that. Moore's Law is a pretty interesting phenomenon. I want to take you back to the start of that period where costs were high and computing power was really low, and the competing technology was uh, vacuum tubes or valves, and they made computers with vacuum tubes in it. And you might, some of you may recall radios that had vacuum tubes that glowed in a sinister way in the back of them if you look behind them. Remember those days? In those days, silicon chips were much more expensive than valves, and they were typically only used in applications where the smallness, the small size of them, and the lightness of them was important, like ballistic missile guidance systems. But as more of them got produced, they went down that cost curve, and gradually silicon chips took over from valves, and you don't get appliances with valves in them any longer. I think for robotics, we're in exactly that position, right at the start of the curve. Yes, robots today for harvesting fruit are slower than pickers. Yes, they're more expensive right now than pickers, but they're on the way down that curve. And when they start going past the cost of using manual labor, there'll be no turning back. Here are some examples up on the screen that you can see here. These are different robots in field trials in different places in the world each one from a different robotics company, each one picking a different type of fruit or vegetable. You've got lettuce, raspberry, tomato, apple, and strawberries here. Just to give you a feel of the pace of this industry, it's coming down that curve quick, and it's gonna be here soon. I've got a video to show. Let's have a look at this video. So here's the question for you. Most other industries, when they deploy robots, they think they're deploying them because of labor costs or labor availability. The interesting thing is they usually find, having deployed them, that that's not where the money comes from. Second order benefits are more valuable than labor savings. The question for each of you, what is the second order benefits that horticulture could get from the deploying robotics, and who's going to capture the value? Key question for our industry to consider. David, what about robots in the marketplace? Right. I mean, interesting enough, of course, uh, you know, great to have robotic pickers, but then sometimes you get a premium for hand picking. And I took this photo just before leaving London. Here we are, Tesco saying, enjoy single te uh, every single Tesco berry because it's hand picked. I notice on the way to the airport from Auckland that Watties is doing exactly the same, saying, our fruit is picked by a very special machine, and the machine is a hand. So robotics in the rest of the, uh, the, the food industry I have a particular interest in what's happening in consumers' end. And boy, if anything, there is such a lot of action in artificial intelligence and robotics through the supply chain. I've just lost the picture. Back again. 
Uh, here we are, Kroger, which is a, a massive retailer supermarket ch chain in the US, working with Ocado, which is uh, probably the best in the world for robotic uh, warehousing. And so there you are in the warehouse, in the distribution center for Kroger. You've got these automatic, these robots working on a regular basis. Kroger, too, bringing in autonomous grocery delivery. This isn't just a pipe dream. It's starting to happen now. These machines are walking the streets or uh, driving through the streets with no drivers. And I might add, David, the machine on the bottom there is actually the founder of that company is a Kiwi working in Silicon Valley on this technology. Well, talking about Kiwis, here we are with uh, KiwiBot. Uh, actually, the, uh, the, the, the genesis of this is not from New Zealand, actually, it's from Latin America. But uh, here's a robot uh, delivery vehicle, which is, uh, they're testing it on campuses in the, the US where it's delivering groceries. Uh, moving on here to Walmart, the largest grocery retailer in the world, and it has a robot in the aisles in its supermarkets now, and what this is doing is checking the shelves to see if there's any gaps. If there is a gap, then there's a message back to those in the back, and they go and fill the shelves. I was, uh, last week, I was talking to the pork industry in the US. I was in Boston, and in the hotel that I was in, which was the uh, Mandarin Oriental, uh, my boarding pass and a snack uh, was delivered to me by this robot that uh, just arrived at my door, phoned me in my room, and then presented the, you know, it's happening, it's out there right now, it's a big, big deal. Uh, what about at retail itself? Well, Amazon, I mean, still to arrive, if you will, in, in New Zealand, but it's, uh, Amazon is just starting to roll out Amazon Go. Amazon Go is sort of little mini Amazons, so little convenience stores, if you will, where you just walk in uh, and walk out, walk in, take what you will from the shelves, and uh, this will be a snack or a ready meal or whatever it is. So there's no payment, it just checks you in and it checks you out. Uh, I mean, from your perspective, what is interesting is what things would they sell in an Amazon Go retail store? Do you think you could buy carrots or uh, uh, potatoes? I don't think so. And so we're seeing these emerging new routes to the consumer. And I think from a horticultural point of view, you've got to say, so what does that mean to us? In what form does my product have to be if it's going to be sold in an Amazon Go store, for example? And, Moving on. Let's, yeah, uh, and in fact, actually, being right on that topic, I think we could select from this menu perhaps lightly processed foods since you were touching on that topic. Do you want to lead us out on that, Dave? Yeah, sure. I mean, I noticed that uh, particularly over the last five years that you just see more and more products. It's certainly in my market, but in many markets of the world. So it's lightly processed fruit and, fruit and vegetable snacks. And I'm wondering, is that a brilliant opportunity for you guys, or is it a threat? Uh, because increasingly, of course, I mean, consumers, they like the idea of fruit and veg. They want it to be natural. They want supply chains which are traceable and transparent. But actually, what they really want, too, is convenience. And actually, convenience often trumps, if you'll allow me to use the term, almost every other factor. And so what I see is your products being used, but they are used in a way where they are just uh, a little bit more easy for consumers to use. Moving on. So, for example, here we go. Uh, products that I see on my shelves any day of the week in, in London. Here's ball salad jars. I mean, they're brilliantly designed. You just can't resist taking them off the shelves. And so, again, if I look at your industry, it's you are providing the raw materials, but somebody else is adding the value. And I think that's the sort of challenge for the horticultural industry, is how close do we want to get to the consumer? Because the closer you get to the consumer, the more value that there is. Uh, eat in color, beautiful products. Uh, and here we go, uh, raw smoothies. So these lightly processed, it may be uh, you know, HPP processed. And I, I noticed that the sort of products you see, they are often, they are startup companies. The investor doesn't come from the horticultural industry. They come often from uh, finance or from Silicon Valley, for example. And there's always a theme here. There's a distinct pattern. The owners 
are very much part of the product. They say, this is me, I'm starting this company, I share your values, you the consumer, I understand you. Uh, mineral processing, as I said, HPP, all natural, of course. Uh, often they'll link with a charity, with good works, etc. Uh, you can, uh, the, the minister was mentioning uh, stories. There's always a story associated with it. And uh, regular folksy blog, and for some reason or other, they always acknowledge their mums. Mind you, perhaps we should all acknowledge our mums. Uh, and here, you know, Unilever, this is, you know, like big deal companies are into it. Unilever will be about the number two or three global food company. And here they are working with Tesco, nice by nature. This is lo ice lollies. And, but if you get into the detail here, it's a fruit ice lolly. It's one of your five a day, and it costs about 25 cents a lolly. Now, do you think children would like that? Yes, I think that sort of wolf in sheep's clothing, or sheep in wolf's clothing, whatever it is, that they're into your market, and they're very heavy-duty competition. Uh, David, I just... Oh, sorry, you yeah, go this one. Sorry. I was just going to pick up on the point you were making on the previous slide on the young entrepreneurs. New Zealand as a country has invested quite heavily in building infrastructure which could support a whole lot of startup companies in this space. We have the Food Innovation Network, pilot plants scattered across the country, including HPP and those sort of light processing technologies. We have uh, accelerators, some of which have the capability of accelerating startup companies in food and incubators for new businesses. We have entrepreneurism being taught in universities, and we have clubs of students, entrepreneurial student clubs, mm -hmm. forming up in universities to support students who wish to leave university and start their own business. So we have all the ingredients of making a great salad in a bowl, yeah. or a great salad in a bowl company in this country. The question is, will we actually do that? Right. Now, as I said, because there are big players out there and they want your part of the market. Let's take the PepsiCo's of this world, just launching a hello goodness healthy vending machine where there will be like smoothies. Where will he put these machines? Right next to wherever you are. Right next to the water uh, in the office. Right at the bottom of the apartment block, etc. Where's your product? in some other inconvenient space. This is big deal competition, I would suggest. We're moving on. Number yeah, three, and yeah. what a good pro <laughs> What would you like to go to, David? I, I think we can't miss on cannabis. Why not? Hands up those who... No, no, perhaps not. <laughs> <laughs> What do you know about cannabis? Well, well, let me talk a little bit about some of the international investment into cannabis. I'm sure it hasn't escaped your notice. A lot of money poured, pouring into cannabis, uh, growing companies around the world with the legalization of growing cannabis. It, a lot of it's gone into the production side. Very large controlled environment growing facilities. But it hasn't stopped there. Once you're producing a lot of cannabis, you now need to think of how you're going to sell the cannabis. We might think it's all going to go into medicinal outlets. That is not the case. Have a look at this next picture. Here's some food products incorporating cannabis within the product, and that is definitely a growing trend. On to the next slide. Here we see a chef who is focusing on introducing cannabis into food within his menu, in his restaurants. And we all know chefs are the modern-day celebrities, and we're going to have one of those on stage a bit later on today. Maybe he's got cannabis in some of his ingredients? Maybe not. Anyway, we're seeing definite trend of cannabis entering food. And last but not least here, you can actually get a degree in cannabis chemistry now in the US. Who would have thought, eh? Students studying cannabis, fancy that. And is it going to be a big deal? It is a big deal. If I uh, uh, look at the, the market or the projections on the market, here we are by when is it, uh, you know, just in the next couple of years, essentially, US 32 billion, and that is only the starters. Uh, apart from being a, a Brit, I also carry a Canadian uh, passport, lived there for 10 years, and Canada is right up in the forefront. Where cannabis legalized there, uh, there's so much action, financial action and uh, commercial action in the cannabis area, and it's not often can uh, Canada is number one, but they are here. I was just taken, for example, here's one of the major Canadian cannabis players buying into uh, actually high-value horticulture in the UK as a base 
to start to produce cannabis once it gets the OK in the UK. And uh, of, so if Canada is number one in terms of legalization, there are about 23 countries, including New Zealand as I understand it, where you may get the tick over the next one or two years. Uh, Every single major brewery, international brewery, and spirits uh, manufacturer is into cannabis. Why? Again, it's the CDB uh, part of it, so it's going to be a... Uh, it, it, instead of alcohol, why not have something else which will give you a little lift? Uh, I can't wait. And look at this down the bottom. I thought the implications for you guys. In Canada, where it's already started, where it is a big deal, Canadian greenhouse uh, sector is saying, hey, this is unfair. The margins in cannabis are so high that it's stealing our labor force. So that's the other side of the coin if you went big deal into cannabis here. Uh, and what, you know, is there opportunities for New Zealand? I would think so. You know, you've got that sort of green and pleasant land. If you're going to be a cannabis user, you want to know exactly where did it come from. And you'd prefer it not to come from the Mexican guy you met around the corner. You know, you want that sort of transparency and traceability. And I think you've got the right story here. Back we go. Yeah, where should we go next, David? What, what about, since we're talking about big production systems, let's talk vertical farming. Right. Here we go, vertical farming. Wow. Uh, I think that is a long way to go. And why, uh, again, the, the minister was uh, saying that what, you can produce enough food, is it for 50 million? It, it always amuses me when people say, New Zealand can feed the world. No, no you can't. You can, as he said, you can feed two large cities frankly. And it's sort of intriguing. If you look around our world, we tend to think in terms of countries. Uh, there's about 196 countries, and it's always trade talks between countries. But actually, as I see the world, I think increasingly it's about mega cities, big deal cities. Let's move forward, say, 5, 10, 20 years, and there'll be about 600 cities of, what, 20 to 40, 50 million people. Enormous size, really. It's astonishing. And the cities, as far as I can see, starting to acknowledge that they've got more in common with each other than they have with their country in many respects, not least because often those big cities are right on the coast and with global warming and sea levels going up, they're saying, how are we going to cope with this? And large cities and the governors of large cities are saying, we want to see more self-sufficiency within our city. We want to be self-sufficient in energy. We want to be self-sufficient in water. And perhaps we want to be self-sufficient in food. Mm. And it seems a bit crazy, but they say, why can't we grow more food in our city or close to our cities, and I think there are opportunities here. Uh, so, for example, let's go to the U.S. The guy on the, with the cowboy hat is a fella called is it Lusk or Musk? Musk. Musk. Do, do we know the Musk guy? His brother is the Tesla. Uh, investor, and actually, uh, his bro this one is also on the board. He has a company called Square Roots. It's an urban farming accelerator. Uh, moving on, here we are. Ocado, remember I mentioned Ocado, which builds these automatic, automated warehouses. Uh, they're now working uh, with the same Musk guy, and they're saying, look, every time we put up a distribution center for groceries, why wouldn't we just have a unit on the side which produced, it, produced all our salad crops, for example, so we can just produce to order? And then the promise to customers is that you know, this was produced right here by you and yesterday. So brilliant opportunities, I would suggest. Plenty. Uh, the, the big deal investors, again, this is backed by Jeff Bezos. Who's Jeff? Jeff is the guy that started Amazon. So this huge money going into this area. And what's it about? It's about extraordinarily sophisticated, high-value horticulture using greenhouses. And as you've seen in this picture and some of the others, the vertical farming is typically leafy greens, leafy green crops with quick rotations. That's where it's starting. But think of that technology disruption curve we've talked about before. That might just be the entrance point. In fact, we know that the technology is there to shrink down traditional large tree crops down into something very small in size, and vine crops too, and to encourage continuous flowering, continuous fruiting. What happens if you take that, which is genetic technologies, and apply it, and it gets market acceptance? What does that do for our industries, which are based on those type of crops? So big questions for New Zealand here. If the world swings very vigorously this way, 
Do we stand outside from that and say, hey, there's a great niche position for the country to be still all natural? Or do we say, actually, no, this is a massive disruptor to us. We need to control part of this business. We need to be in this game ourselves. A really big set of decisions for the horticultural industry coming at us over the next couple of years. Mm. And, you know, what grows well in the, this sort of vertical farming, just to link to the, uh, to the previous bit, is cannabis, mm. frankly. Uh, you know, some of you might have tried it earlier in a small scale. Uh, I can't wait for it all to come. I, 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 without sharing my particular problems, for about 40 years I've been arthritic, and I have to take a cocktail of drugs every morning, to, sort of largely for pain relief. Uh, although, far and away, the best pain relief as far as is alcohol. Mm. Uh, and I'm trying to give my liver a rest. I'm just a little skinny guy, but actually my liver is the same size as Tasmania. <laughs> and if I can possibly maybe use some cannabis, that will do instead of the, the bubbly. Uh, so, you know, fingers crossed, David. Mm. Yeah, there we go. And what's, what's next? Yeah, how are we going for time, David? Look, yeah. we're, we're doing oh, we're all right. Well, I think we're about yeah. halfway through. Yeah. So, so what should we do next? Actually, <laughs> since we've been talking about novel growing systems, perhaps in novel crops, perhaps we could go to seaweed. Seaweed, why not? Oops, yeah, there it is. Uh, hang on. Right, possibilities of seaweed. What's yeah, that about? Yeah, so, so look, have a look at this slide. You can see some of the potential uses for seaweed sitting here. Biofuels, biomaterials. You can use it as a livestock feed, and actually, if you use the right one, it's methane reducing. And you can actually use it as a food itself. So potentially big um, opportunities for seaweed. So here's the question. Next slide, please. Could your next orchard look like that? New Zealand... A relatively small country on land area, we're by number 77 or something like that in the world, right next to places like Gabon, but in, in the top 10 set for sea area, we're a sea superpower, right up next to countries like the US when it comes to sea area. Have we been looking at this all wrong all along? It's a funny old thing, isn't it? We think that we just have to grow on land. And, yeah, indeed. Uh, you know, and like so, so next slide. Yeah, on we go. And here's an interesting um, photo I've picked up. Here's a Dutch weed burger. I'm willing to bet that there was the odd tourist wandering through Amsterdam who saw that and got completely the wrong idea yeah, and yeah. was expecting a very different ingredient in that burger. Yeah, and they never thought they'd be smoking um, seaweed. No, mm. no, 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 that's uh, quite right. And, and yet, you know, so should we su be surprised that seaweed is a food? No, you know, it's been an integral component of Asian cuisine for thousands of years. And I, I, I think its moment has come again, frankly. It's going to be a big deal. Uh, so who out there wants to be in the seaweed farm business? Uh, what have we got next? Uh, I, th I think since we're on the topic of waves and water, we could do waves of vegetarian on the top of the menu there. Right. Perhaps I can kick that one off. Right. Um, waves of vegetarian, we've seen a lot of dialogue around the world going vegetarian. And my personal view on this is, yes, we will see some significant changes, but human diets change very slowly. And there's a pretty good historical reason for that because our distant ancestors that ran through the rainforest sampling every berry that they came across tended to have a short life expectancy. In fact, our ancestors are far more likely to be the guy that followed along behind and said, yeah, just wait and see what happens as he eats that berry. I might not dive into this trend too quickly. And we see that play out throughout history. Human diet changes very slowly in series of slow steps. And vegetarianism as a wave on um, the Western society is not a new thing. I want to take you back quite some distance to the late 1900s when there was a massive burst of vegetarianism. In fact, it sounds a lot like today because there were vegetarian restaurants opening up in cities like London and even mainstream existing restaurants put vegetarian items on their menu. Sound familiar? It also started a spark of startup companies around the world, a number of which are still here today in their multi-billion dollar corporations 100 years later. Companies like Kellogg's or Sanitarium or Post, very big organizations today. In fact, if you look at Kellogg's original lineup of products, it was cornflakes, which of course we all knew, but the other product in their initial product lineup, a plant-based alternative to butter, later called peanut butter, mm. and a plant-based alternative to meat, which mysteriously vanished from their repertoire quite quickly, so I suspect it tasted terrible. 
Let's, what have we got next? But it's a sort of intriguing time, isn't it? Because it doesn't matter what you pick up. You see this sort of, as you said, wave of vegetarianism. And the meat industry is feeling most uncomfortable. Uh, and again, if you read the foodie magazines, you think the world has gone vegetarian. Well, actually, I mean, here we are in the US, that eating meat is still the norm. So 86% of uh, consumers in that large country are still the fundamental meat eaters, but increasingly see this group called flexitarian. Uh, so, so there's 5% of vegetarian and vegan, and that really hasn't moved a great deal. But it's that middle piece, that flexitarian bit, where people say, I like meat, I'm just going to eat less of it. Actually, interestingly enough for the meat industry, they say, I'm going to eat less meat, but when I eat meat, I want to eat better meat. Uh, but also on more vegetable-based, more, uh, more plant-based uh, products. It's, it's the same in the UK, I might tell you, but actually it's more advanced, where that flexitarian portion is the better part of 15% of people are saying actively, I want to reduce meat consumption, I want to eat more fruit and vegetables. But if I look what's happened in the last just seven months, for goodness sake, here we are, 2019, so since January of this year. Here we've got Carl Jr., you know that. Well, across the US, the Vegan Beyond Burger launched uh, in, in, in the US. Here we go with the Beyond Meat Burger, A&W again, a uh, international chain, but particularly in North America. I was in Canada at the time when I had my first one. You have to, you're lucky if you can buy this because they just move off the shelves so quickly. Uh, McDonald's in Germany uh, just launched their big vegan burger. Who are they buying? It for, they're buying it from Nestle, for goodness sake, so you know, the biggest food company in the world into this sort of business. Uh, here's the Impossible Whopper, uh, now going national in the US. I, I, again, the vegetarian burger. Uh, Subway, we know it well. Uh, the new meaty vegan garlic wrap. Uh, you know, there's something going on out there. Here we are in the UK, uh, that McDonald's launched their first ever vegetarian happy meal for children. Again, it's just whisking off the shelf. That must be an opportunity for this industry, surely. So, uh, yeah, yeah so, so let me just close out that session by saying Kellogg's meant to change the world. They did seek to make everyone vegetarian when they launched. They didn't clearly succeed in doing that, but they did create breakfast cereals and they changed the Western breakfast for the next 100 years. So what's going to come out of this trend? I don't know. I pick it's not going to convert the world to vegetarianism, but it might just change a chunk of the Western diet. Yeah, sure. And that's it. Again, back to the meat industry, they're sort of panicking, saying, uh, are we going to see this big swing? Look, the meat industry uh, globally, I don't know, it's billions and billions. Uh, this move towards a, a more vegetarian diet, look, if it took... 10, 15% of the global market for me, it would be massive, bigger than Ben-Hur, as they say, huge. And that's what I expect to see. No, the world is not going vegetarian. Actually, interestingly enough, the, I mean, the, in Asia, they, I think they've been flexitarian for the last mm. 4,000 years. And you know, for all of us, who we all travel in Asia, and when you have a meal there, we don't have, uh, in New Zealand, you're so sort of meat-centric. For goodness sake, if I look at your meat consumption, I'm astonished that you could afford the time to be here. You, you, you should be home, sort of chewing on the rear end of some large mammal. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, it's about time you reduce meat consumption. However, well, let's, I think go, let's go on. I think we're on a roll, Dave. Let's you, talk plant protein. Plant protein. My, my. Yeah, mm. yes. I mean, protein, uh, again, if you think the particularly Western markets, protein normally was another word for meat. But all I see is mm. that the, the canopy... I mean, if we're in horticulture, we understand the word canopy, that the protein canopy is just getting broader and broader and broader. So meat might still be in the center, but what else is proteinaceous? Well, it's plant-based mm. stuff, it's dairy-based stuff. Let's have a look here. Uh, so this food revolution, uh, here's a, a headline from just last week from UBS. So what's UBS? Well, it's a, it's a global bank, it's a Swiss bank, and we're used to seeing headlines saying the world is going vegetable-based uh, from special interest groups, from the Vegetarian Society of New Zealand or whatever. But here is a, international, a global bank saying, okay, that plant-based segments will be 85 billion uh, by the end of the next decade. That's huge. As people seek out, what do we say, alternative options that are more environmentally friendly, according to this 
great investment bank. And again, if I go to my, my market, this is a sort of wonderful example of a flexitarian product. So it's, first of all, it's a branded sausage product. It's men's health. Men's health is, and always has been, a bodybuilding mag magazine for men largely. But now it's cool, not wussy, for men to be concerned about their health. And Men's Health Kitchen, this lean pork sausage, is 50% pork and 50% haricot beans. Uh, what's the product like? Brilliant. It's lower fat, higher fiber. I can't tell the difference between that and regular s sausages. Uh, from a mum point of view, uh, your, your children Will, who like sausages, will eat this and not even know they've had a vegetable. So essentially, it's like a stealth vegetable. Brilliant. Do I think it's got uh, market traction? Absolutely. This has got a long way to go. Who's going to grow the haricot beans? Uh, you know, are you bean growers here? Uh, here we go. Is it just a sort of silly British thing? Not at all. About three weeks ago, I was in Italy, and I thought, it'd be interesting to look on the supermarket shelves in Italy, because Italy has such a strong food culture. You'd think they're not going to pick up in these sort of fancy fads and fashions of, of, of food. Damn me, there was meters of shelf space of these flexitarian uh, products. And uh, here we are, it's a US slide of their view of what's happening in Western Europe. 16 to 36 linear feet within the meat case is now vegetable based. And that was in the Netherlands and in Belgium. What have you got next? And look, the biggest food companies in the world are into this. This, again, is not sort of silly little startups. Here's Unilever, they've just bought the vegetarian butcher from uh, Holland. Uh, and here's Nestle with their Garden Gourmet. It's big deal stuff. It's got a long way to go. And it's in your area. Uh, I like this too for mushroom people. Cumberland Shroom Dogs. It's a Sainsbury private label product. What do they taste like? Brilliant. Again, high fiber, relatively high protein. Uh, just beautiful, frankly. So, so a question for New Zealand. Is this an opportunity or a threat for New Zealand? There's a number of people that think it's a threat. I don't agree with them. I think it's an opportunity for New Zealand. And here's why. I look back at history, and I remember a similar sort of scenario back from the 1980s. Remember the cholesterol scenario from the 1980s? Health research at the time showing a correlation between cholesterol and heart disease. Many people saying, hey, this is the end of the dairy industry as we know it. Some people in the dairy industry saying, this is the end of the world as we know it. It turned out not to be the case. It actually turned out to be a great opportunity for a number of players. So who made money out of that trend? Firstly, the margarine companies clearly did. People who owned branded margarine products did very well. They went from being something you were a bit embarrassed about and were typically sold into bulk tra uh, caterers where you could slip it onto bread when no one knew what the yellow stuff really was. It came from there to the middle of the supermarket and people were proudly buying it. So great for them. It was great for food ingredient manufacturers who sold colors, flavors, stabilizers, emulsifiers, all of those things. Specialty food companies did really well. Equipment manufacturers who made margarine equipment did really well. And surprisingly, some dairy companies did really well. How did the dairy companies do well out of a trend that looks so negative for them? Well, some of them got really smart and did blends. I'll blend vegetable oil in with my butter and do a blend. The vegetable oil is cheaper than the milk fat, so hey, I'm making the same margin, uh, same price, higher margin for selling this product. Some got smarter again and did half fat products. They replaced the um, milk fat with water and sold it at butter prices. Now that's pretty good economics. Some got really clever and did ultra low fat products, sold it at an even higher price because it was ultra low fat and made mega bucks on the water they were putting in those products. So people that rode the trend made money, those that fought it lost out. So I think for us, this is a trend. The question we have is, how will we ride it to be successful? And here's a whole lot of different places countries can play on this slide in front of you. Yeah. Definitely something for the country to consider. David. But mind you, it's, it's not without its threat this, for the, the, the dairy industry. It's sort of interesting in the US, if I look at fluid milk consumption in the US, over the last 12 years, it's reduced by 25%. 
And as all of us know, anybody who's based in large cities uh, where coffee is, is, is booming as a, as a business, then something like 50% of people are actually electing to use plant-based milks rather than sort of regular uh, dairy milk. And so what does that mean to a Fonterra? I know this is not a, you know, a, a, a dairy audience, but I'd say the same to a Fonterra as I'd say to, uh, to meat companies. So let me start with meat. If I look at the global meat companies of this world, the, the companies like JBS out of Brazil, but they're, they're ev ev everywhere, I'm saying, of course you're in the meat business, but you also have to offer flexitarian products, and you also probably should be in the vegetable-based in uh, quotes, meat business too. And I would say the same to Fonterra. Yes, the guts of your business is about milk from cows, but if you're not into plant-based milks, you're missing a trick, frankly. And in the US, the biggest owners of plant-based milk brands, dairy companies. So people who fight the trend lose, people yeah. that ride the trend yeah. win. Yeah. Let, let's keep on going, David, because we're using up our time. What should, we, what should we go to next? Oh, my Lord. I mean, we've been a bit radical here. Let's do food from air, because right. that looks pretty intriguing. Right, this must be you. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and and here this way, read this out for, yeah, I was vegan for a while until a bunch of other people started being vegan too. Now I exist on just air and my own smug self-importance. And that's actually not quite so silly as it sounds. Have a look at this next slide. This is a company out of Finland making food out of thin air. They've picked up technology developed for the space program that uses energy and CO2 and fully synthesizes food with those as the starting raw materials. It's a fairly radical form. In fact, next slide might help us here. It's a fairly radical form of a technology that's growing out there, and that is synthetic foods, taking raw materials into a big stainless steel tank and creating foods. And all foods are potentially makeable via this technology. Big question here for us, will consumers buy it? And if they do, is it a threat or an opportunity for New Zealand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. because remember, we're going to add another 2 billion folk over the next 30 mm. years, by, by the by. Um, here you are, what, what, what's New Zealand? Four and a half million. Heading right? for five, we'll get Heading there one day, five. Dave. And you're lovely people. <laughs> you, you, you know, you're really, you're cracking people and you can fit you all on a bus. <laughs> yeah, but better move on. Yeah, we better move on, we yeah, better yeah. move on. What next, Dave, what do you think? Uh, oh, well, let's see, I'll look at my list and look yeah. at your list. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's human the, biome, we haven't the, done that one. The human biome. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes, do you want to introduce it? Yes, I will. A and I want to introduce this with a story of twins. And here we go, a slide of world-famous twins here. Just to introduce the story. In fact, not twins at all, really. <laughs> Our little secret is we're actually genetic clones, yeah, yeah. early yeah. experiments in cloning. It's not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> no. The twins I'm really talking about are a twin study done at Imperial College, where David comes from. They studied twins and identical twins, genetically identical individuals, and their response to food, and found that their bodies responded quite differently to the same food. So how could that be? That's quite a puzzler. Genetically identical twins, yet some of them are putting on weight from eating food and others are not. How could this possibly happen? Turns out they had forgotten the whole chunk of genetics that's really important, and that's the genetics of the biome. The biome is around two kilograms of bacteria, yeast, and viruses that sit in our gut. Mm -hmm. And there's more different genetics in there than the rest of your body put together. The mass of DNA in your gut is bigger than the DNA in every other part of your body put together. What's more, every other cell in your body should have identical DNA to every other cell in your body. There's thousands of different organisms in your gut, each with its own unique DNA. So it's probably not surprising that these twins were responding differently because there was a massive piece of DNA or genetics that they had forgotten about, the genetics of your gut. And they're finding really interesting things as they start to study this. You can change the makeup, the mix of different organisms in your gut by changing the food that people eat. And what's more, because the organisms in your gut typically pre-digest the food for you, they break it down and chew it for you, spitting out some byproducts. These byproducts actually affect the way our bodies operate including things like mood. And they've done some clinical studies showing that by diet, you can actually affect depression in many cases if you change the gut uh, bacteria makeup. 
So by transplanting the right bacteria into people's gut who are suffering from some types of depression, they can actually cure depression. So this is pretty significant sort of medical science happening as we speak. The key part for this audience is a lot of people are saying, and you can do that by altering food, and often plant-based foods are things that move the biome in the right direction. So expect some major stuff in this area yeah. over the next 10 years. Yeah, couldn't agree more that if, you've got, if your product has any claim in stress reduction or mood improvement, it's sort of brilliant people. And actually, you don't really even need the, the scientific basis to uh, you know, it just, just mention that it's good for stress reduction and uh, it'll do well. What have we got here? So, yeah, health and, and, and well-being mentioned by both the finance guy, uh, direct uh, mm -hmm. minister and, the, uh, and Damien. Uh, look, every country uh, has got its own uh, eat well guide. As I mentioned, I'm can, uh, Canadian. Here's the most recent Canada food guide. And first of all, the nice thing for you guys, I mean, look at the, uh, what proportion of the plate is fruit and vegetable? So most of it, as far as I can see. Can you imagine how good the meat guys feel in Canada? Spot the meat on this plate. And you know, right at the top, just uh, on is it the right-hand side, as I look at it anyway, there's a little teeny bit of meat. And what does it say about uh, uh, beverages? Make water your drink of choice. I mean, again, the dairy guys aren't celebrating that. Uh, that's Canada. Uh, the U.S. would be essentially the same if the politics of food eating were not so strong there, where the agricultural lobbies, is, or particularly the livestock and meat lobby, is saying, you can't say that about meat. But what so sort of intrigues me about the, the health and well-being, but let me ask this uh, audience, what proportion, who has a, a Fitbit? Fitbit, yeah, and it'll be, here we go. Uh, I mean, relatively few, but what does that suggest? That a lot of you need to get out more. <laughs> I, I, I think that's by the by. But, you know, increasingly, we, like, we use technology uh, to uh, monitor our health and, uh, and well-being. And I just see that coming at a rush, mm. David. So, for example, different lifestyles will determine what our diets are. So for example, just taking this one here, if you want to be you know, the big strong guy with the large muscles, etc., then there's a specific diet. On the other hand, if your concern is perhaps weight control, then there's another diet. Or do you want to be more zen-like? There's another diet. Or do you have a specific health problem? It might be high blood pressure or cholesterol related, or then you have another diet. And what we're seeing increasing is technology that will help us to take this decision. So for example, back to Imperial College, that a colleague of mine, Chris Tomazu, he's developed and patented the DNA nudge. There it is on the screen. So what's the DNA nudge? Little teeny machine, you know, just like this flicker that I've got. And what you do is take one of those cotton buds that you clean your ears out with, swab your mouth, pop it into the DNA nudge, so it's got a fingerprint of your DNA, I suppose. And then when you're shopping, that you just take your DNA nudge and go zap against the barcode of the food product you're about to buy, and it will give you a reading on whether that's good or less than good for you personally. Mm -hmm. And this is being tested right now in Waitrose, you know, a major supermarket chain in, in the UK. So it's not scotch mist, it's real stuff, and it's coming at a rush. I um, mean, from your perspective, to say, how would we stand? Is this good for us? It probably is. Uh, that we want to be, so that, you know, the products you produce, good for well-being. And again, just one example from the US, we've got nutrigenomics, uh, genetic testing for personalized nutrition. You just see more and more of this. Have you got anything on this? No, I think, I think we'll move on. I, I think we've got about 10 minutes on picking data. Yeah, I'm just yeah. looking for anyone waving us off the stage. And I think we've got about 10 minutes. Let's just do a couple more, shall we? Shall we do the um, berry um, fruit sports performance? Because I've got a question for you on this one. Right. New Zealand's been investing for a while now trying to understand the medical benefits of the products that we produce in this country. In fact, we've got a national science challenge that looks at this. So it's an area we've been focusing on. We've been looking at kiwi fruit and we've been looking at a range of other crops, but particularly looking at berry fruit. Yeah. And there's some pretty useful indicators of, of health and well-being from consuming berry fruit. Do you think we're looking in the right place? Right. You know, the, 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 the berry fruit, they're having a moment, aren't mm. they? I mean, if I look in, in my own market, it's, uh, it, it's brilliant. I think I've got, I hope I've got 
So he, he, I mean, fresh berries are doing so well in the UK that increasingly you'll see this in the fruit and veg section. You know, it's fruit and berries. So, you know, there's fruit, there's just regular stuff, and then almost at a higher level, there are berries, and they're getting more and more shelf space. Uh, actually, if you take some, you know, don't want to be boring, but let's have a look at some statistics. If you went back 12 years ago, uh, then berries essentially were 18% of the value of our fruit bowl. So of all the fruit purchased at retail, 18% was on fresh berries. Now, it's essentially 25%. So a quarter of the value of all fruit purchased in the UK is for fresh berries. I mean, why I find that interesting, David, pe people, you know, mm. why do you think they've been so successful? Uh, it's a combination of reasons. One is they're perceived they've got this health halo. People understand that they've got the antioxidants or whatever mm. it is, and I, actually, in particular, I would say blueberries, actually, but mm. that's another matter. So th they've got this health halo. And secondly, they're snackable. Mm. And, you know, you can just pop them in your mouth. They're just sort of uh, brilliant. But they are expensive. Yet, in our industry, we often say that, that uh, consumers are driven by price. Well, not as far as fresh berries are concerned. And uh, so, are there opportunities here? You know, you've done some great work, not least in black currants, actually, mm. I think, in, in, in New Zealand. But, you know, the issue, for, certainly for us in the UK, is that we're just not competitive to produce fresh berries at a cost which would make them uh, useful in, sort of in a processed product. And so, for example, if we were to take, take black currants, uh, actually, we could do it for black currants. Why? Because it's automatic mm, harvesting, because mm. you, you can combine them. But say with strawberries or, or raspberries, because we're still not at that stage, that anything that is of a processed strawberry or processed ra uh, raspberry or blueberry, for that matter, it would never be grown in the UK. We'd be buying from Poland, we'd be buying from Serbia, etc. But I think people have got, they understand fresh berries, wow, bang. It's that sort of very high health benefit. The issue, though, often with health benefits for your products, and everybody knows fresh fruit and vegetables are healthy, but then what for? And also, if people, if, they, if the health benefit, they'll also ask the question, how long is it going to take to deliver the benefit? And particularly for that group who we refer to as the millennials, they're lovely people, millennials, you know, like anybody under the age of 35, but one thing they haven't got is patience. And so if there's a benefit, I want that delivered within three months. And that's having the science to prove that actually it's worthwhile me investing in this product because I know the benefit's going to be delivered within three months. Yeah. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you, David. Uh, are we moving? Uh, I oh, think we are. Yeah, yes. I think we are. I think we've got we time got? for maybe one or two more. Should we do the Asian high-value food market? Yes, ain't right. And I, uh, you must be as intrigued as we are about, you know, you look when you see stories like this. Single bunch of grapes sells for US $11,000 mm. in Japan. And you say, right, that's the market for me. Of course, the, the reality is they only sell one bunch. But that's by the by. But that's sort of opportunity in Asia, one should never underestimate it because they are great ones for celebrating special occasions, whether that be Chinese New Year or indeed even around that Christmas period, even if, they're not sort of, if the religion isn't Christian. So they're great gift givers. And they're great gift givers, they like to give food, I would suggest. And this, yeah. is, this, so, is, this is some of ours. So this, is, this is the work that we did with Mintel, looking at gift giving in China. Just a couple of things I want to point out to you. See the, um, about halfway down the list, price range, ordinary urban folk giving gifts, 100 to $400 per gift. Now think about that for giving fruit or vegetables, which is a common gift. If you're aiming too low, you're going to miss this market. This market needs to be giving gifts that say, I respect you, I value you, I've parted with a lot of money for this gift. That's a bit like turning up on Valentine's Day with a cheap bottle of Coke. It's kind of not going to work unless the gift is valuable. So we've got to aim higher if we're going to hit this market. We're going to have to say if we hit this market, this is a premium product, this is a high value product, and this is a very big market. Over 50% of gifts given are food. See the point there? Yeah. A significant opportunity for us if we market it right. 
and as they say, imported foods are, are, are built in. They have built-in gift appeal, and particularly products from New Zealand. The, the expectation is they've got that sort of green and healthy aura that, uh, that you pronounce for New Zealand. And uh, no, it's uh, take advantage of it. Mm. Uh, for me, using the American expression, say, do the math. Let's go through it. You're good at cherries, one. The Chinese love cherries, two. If I look at what's happening to Chinese tourist arrivals in, uh, in, in New Zealand, they've just gone past Aussies. I mean, the Aussies, lots of Aussies come, but they don't spend any money. Chinese mm -hmm. come here and spend lots. So you've got tourist numbers from China are growing sharply. Four, the forecasted Chinese visitors, they'll require 20 plus more planes per week landing in Auckland or Christchurch or, 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 or wherever, and the space in those machines. That means that you have access to not just the Shanghai's and the Guangzhou's of this world or Hong Kong, that they're flying into the major tier one cities uh, that, uh, so you can go di direct. I think it's uh, particularly for cherries. It's, and, and I'm sure you know and you're taking advantage now, but there's sort of brilliant examples that you can take those opportunities mm. for very high value. They love cherries. They'll love your cherries, for goodness sake. Fantastic. Now, we've got time for one more, I think. One more. David, yep. let's, let's do one of your specialities. Let's do e-commerce. E-commerce, why not? Here we, here we go. Look, again, this is sort of a, a bit statistically, but the fact of the matter is, if you look, forget about New Zealand for the moment, I know you find that difficult, but if you look sort of glo <laughs> globally, then if you look at global retail trends, what is clear is that traditional supermarkets, I mean, some supermarkets of, the, no, of the, the type we know and love, in terms of their access to consumers, their moment has peaked. Their relative power has peaked. And so, uh, in terms of routes to the consumer, which are the ones that are growing? First of all, hard discounters. Uh, the ones you haven't got in New Zealand at the moment, but you'll know the ones I'm talking about. It's Aldi, which you know from Australia, but it's a, you know, a German hard discounter. Lidl, which is a competitor of Aldi, which we have in the UK as well as Aldi. Both are in the US, and they're growing, and they're growing at pace. And next would be e-commerce, so, you know, so online grocery, if you will. It's not the biggest deal by any means in New Zealand, but it is growing very, very quickly in some markets. And then the third area that's growing is convenience, so smaller stores. So around the world, consumers are going less often to those great big barns. Mm. Is it, what is it, pick and pay? Is it, is it pick and pay here? No. What's the... Uh, Pack and, pack and save? Pack and save, yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, the big mm -hmm. barns. Are, so, so I, I love yeah. to go there. I love <laughs> to go to pack and save because it gives me an opportunity to see people I, I wouldn't normally meet socially. <laughs> but so so, so, so it's, it's sort of convenience. So you've got hard discount, online grocery, and convenience. People are shopping more often in smaller stores, and they'll buy when they need. Mm. So that sort of going out for the four-week purchase is just less and less around the world. And so who's leading the way on online grocery? Don't go to the US. Largely don't go to Europe either. It's, it's, it's in Asia. If you look at South Korea in particular, but China, which is just below the UK, but it's such a bigger market, mm. and it's just absolutely booming. Mm. And again, so, so what? I think you've got to look at your product and say, look, we're starting to see different ways you can reach consumers. What form should my product be in for each of those different channels, because they require different formats, I would say. So fresh food, challenging for online. But if it, if it, online is in some markets, it's a challenge. It's really interesting. Australia, New Zealand, for example, if you take on a, a grocery online, or sorry, fruit and vegetable online, if you ask people in New Zealand or in Australia, would you allow your local supermarket, for example, to select the fruit and vegetables for your own family and then send it to you? Often as not, when I ask that question, there's a spontaneous burst of laughter because they assume that I'm sort of trying to be funny. And what it suggests to me is the lack of trust in major mm. supermarkets. Whereas in China, not at all. The, the view would be that's a, a, a natural way for us to buy products. Who wants to go outside in all the traffic? And also, if they look at wet markets, increasingly that younger, that millennial group of China is saying, we don't want to buy any food there. It's just disgusting. So, you know, is the growth coming in online? Absolutely. 
And why wouldn't it be? I love this. It's just a, a nice, little, you know, a, again, a look at e-commerce with the different glasses. Remember, you know, customers who bought this also bought. Looks like everybody's grandmother. There we go. And uh, again, uh, if you look at online, as I said, it looked towards Asia, often looked towards China. I just picked this up this week. Consumers, in this particular case, it, it's rather like uh, it, uh, it's something that actually has been on offer in Japan for, for some years, but consumers book produce pre-harvest from cooperatives, and then once harvest comes, it's delivered two days post-harvest at discount to retail prices. Who's organizing this? It's Alibaba. So Alibaba is essentially the Chinese Amazon. So big deal, high-tech companies are now getting direct to farm and direct to consumers. I think it's, uh, and we're just going to see more and more of that, frankly. And again, different routes to the consumer. I mean, who would have thought this? This is Danone, one of the great food uh, processing companies, dairy processors in, in, in the world. And here they are investing in the US in farmer's fridge. And so what would you expect to see in a vending machine? Normally, you would expect to see a Snickers bar, you know, a Mars bar or something. Well, here, it, it's salads. It's salads for lunch being sold in vending machines. Where will you see these vending machines? Right next to where people are working or living. Mm -hmm. So that's access, to the, it's that convenience to purchase. I think that about... Yeah, uh, I, I know there's a couple on there we haven't got to, Dave, but we're out of time. So. No, I've got... The, that's, there's a last little end thing. Uh, Hang on. There we go. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's a good place to yeah. end. Yeah, so, so let me just start by thanking David for the conversation. That was great fun, as always, David. Yeah. Always enjoy a conversation with you. And thank you, everyone in the room, too, for joining in on that conversation. I think, as you've heard here, there's some factors that are really strong supporting the ongoing growth of our industry. We've seen how technology could get behind us with things like robotics via the e-commerce channels. There's a bundle of factors that should support our growth, but we also saw some significant questions that we as an industry have to ask. And perhaps the biggest one is how do we want to be in market? How much are we willing of money and effort and energy are we willing to invest in the marketplace to ensure that we capture value that's created from these long-term trends? I think if we get that right, then collectively we can create a smart green future for New Zealand. Thank you. And I think just one last is look at this plate again. And, you know, what proportion of this plate do you have? A lot, I would say. And this is often which health authorities saying it should be half fruit and veg. I think actually what we want is we want at least half of the mind share of consumers. Uh, because we all know that it, we should be eating more fruit and veg. The fact of the matter is that right around the world, particularly in, uh, in higher income countries, we underperform in terms of consumption. Mm. That we don't hit our five plus uh, targets because we don't have 50% mind share. We just have to be better at getting our message across to consumers. And uh, thanks. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you. Thanks thank for you. Listening.